Wow, do I have a crazy story for you guys. Sorry if it's a little long. This experience has caused me a lot of anxiety and it actually feels therapeutic typing this out. During my freshman year of college in New Hampshire a girl in my dorm hall accidentally caused a small dorm room fire by leaving popcorn in too long at like 3 a.m. We all had to evacuate and the fire trucks came and the RAs made a pretty big stink about it. The girl who lit the fire was the subject of many YK yak jokes and I felt bad for her because she really really wasn't attractive and she looked pathetically lonely and plus causing microwave fires seemed like a pretty innocent mistake for such harsh comments. A couple days after the incident I saw her in the resident hall and made casual small talk by asking her how things were popping and kinda just checking up on her cause I felt bad. She laughed and that was kinda a conversation of about two minutes. Fast forward to a week later and I hear a knock on my dorm door and the same girl, who I am now going to refer to as Popcorn, comes literally running into my room with no hesitation. I didn't even tell her my room number and at the time I just figured she just saw me go in there once cause she didn't even know my name at this point. It takes me a second to realize that she is in full blown tears. There is now a stranger on my bed in tears and I'm just like oh oh uh. So I counsel her like the bleeding heart I am and ask what's wrong. She tells me that the black dining hall cook sexually assaulted her and the college wouldn't fire him and she was suffering emotionally because of it. Being a victim of assault myself I really sympathized with her situation and gave her my phone number in case she needed help walking to the dining hall with a safety net and whatnot. I don't take sexual assault lightly. The night after our conversation in my room I got a call from her to walk her down to the dining hall because the black cook that assaulted her was working that day. I walked her down to get food and she just lit up like a glow stick and a whole new person emerged. It didn't matter that her assailant was in the room. She was talking my ear off about pretty little liars, one direction, etc. A lot of things I just didn't really care about but then again she had no one to talk to and the situation was complicated. I just listened and nodded my head. Over the course of about two weeks give or take I had walked her down to the dining hall about maybe four or five times. She may have been a victim of assault but she was also a very annoying and unappealing person. For God's sake she actually talked about herself in third person. Her story about the assault became inconsistent and there were always new major developments about what happened and the story was changed to something much more drastic and severe. It went from assault to full on gang rape as her story developed. Then she made a comment one day along the lines of how she wished that someone would drop a bomb on black people so they would finally learn to stop raping made me immediately uncomfortable and unsettled. I didn't want to walk her down or interact with her anymore. The week of Thanksgiving reprieve I went back home to visit my family while Popcorn stayed on campus. During that week I had 60 missed phone calls from Popcorn. One day I even had 20 X calls in the span of a couple hours. No normal person does that. Red flags definitely were rising if they hadn't been already. When I got back to the campus, there was a knock on my door and sure enough it was Popcorn crying again. She tells me that because I wasn't on campus to protect her she was raped by a Muslim guy while walking to Panera Bread and the Filipino RA groped and slapped her boobs. If red flags were being raised then this was full on sirens. I'm no rape apologist by any means but the rape to ratio rate was expositionally high. Especially since these three assaults happened within a month's time frame, all by people of color seemingly at random. She was making these stories up to elicit some sick form of sympathy and as an actual victim of assault I was beyond offended. I told her I had to leave for class and ran the fuck off to my friend to ask for advice. It got really crazy really fast. I warned the RA officers about her and they told me they would talk to her. During class I was up to 100 plus missed phone calls and a series of individual messages that just said HI. I was done with this shit. I wanted nothing to do with her. I blocked her number and went back to my dorm. That week after classes I just went straight to my dorm. I did not want to see her. One day I had to go to the bathroom so I walked to the stall to do my business. I'm just casually in there peeing with my pants around my ankles when Popcorn literally fucking crawls on the bathroom floor and dips her head underneath the stall door and says, H.A. I knew you would eventually come out. I'm freaked the fuck out and in near tears. I tell her I'm wicked busy. I don't have time for her and that I was upset for invading my privacy. It took a lot of courage to do because I struggled deeply with confrontation. She tells me all about how she is thinking of dying because her mom died when she was young. Some manipulative shit that I was just not in the mood for. 
I'll leave her in the bathroom and go to my room and lock the door. I watched some YouTube videos and took a nap when I was rudely awakened by not knocking but pounding on my door. I did not answer. The pounding just continued and got louder. Open this door or I'm going to kill you. Open the door or I will kill you. Open this door or I will kill you. And she just waited and waited outside my dorm singing songs into the door cracks for an hour. I was so scared I just cried and called my dad to pick me up from school. I didn't have many friends that lived on campus since it was a small college and a lot of people commuted and this whole situation just made me feel so isolated. My mental health was deteriorating rapidly. The RAs had been informed of the threats made at my door by other students observing what happened and she was given a warning but that was all. One night I had my boyfriend who lived three hours away at the time come to spend the night at the college. We had been watching a movie and now were napping on my bed when all we heard was the door open. Like an idiot I had completely spaced out and forgot to lock the door. Popcorn came running in and jumped on top of us and said in a baby voice, Popcorn wants cuddles. I was beyond creeped out and was basically screaming, what the hell? My boyfriend being the no-nonsense confrontational person he has told her to get the absolute fuck out of my room. She told him that she would and I quote, just go and die like her mother did when she was three and inject cancer into herself. My boyfriend smiled and said, good, and then pushed her out of the room and slammed the door giving zero fucks. Swear he almost slammed her fingers shut. I love him. We reported her to the campus police in the morning and still nothing major came of it. That was until there was another popcorn fire in her dorm not too far after and she got kicked out. I wish that's where the story ends with her but unfortunately no. After she left the dorms my resident life became a lot easier. I made a lot of new normal friends and I was feeling a lot less anxious. One day a girl in one of my classes invited me to go to the mall with her to go get our nails done. Now this nail salon had clear glass so you could see the rest of the outside mall when you were getting your nails done. I'm all relaxed when all of a sudden I see Popcorn's fucking face pressed up against the glass of this nail salon and she is with a morbidly obese neck beard. I'm getting my nails done and she is literally staring at me through the window for a good 10 minutes with this man. To say that I was unnerved was an understatement. I told my friend what was going on and we booked it out of there and they tried hard to follow. In retrospect that is when I should have called the real police. After the mall I had a bunch of random friend requests from profiles with a small Yorkie dog as the profile pic and several message requests. I opened them and they were from Popcorn asking me to be her bridesmaid at a Pizza Hut wedding that she and her fiancé were having in two years. You can't even make this shit up. There was another message about how she was so upset that I didn't acknowledge her at the mall and she had waited so long to introduce me to her doting fiancé and she was so upset with me that she wanted to wring my neck. Of course I blocked all those profiles and things were pretty silent. I've been living with my boyfriend and going to school in Rhode Island for two years now. I'm loving school and I have an excellent group of friends. About five months ago, I got home from work. I had three missed calls from a random New Hampshire number. Thinking it was one of my family members, I called back and nope it was popcorn on the other end. I imminently hung up. There was also a voicemail left that was just a person breathing into the phone and telling me that I was expected at the wedding. I cried and called the police urgently about the number. I don't know what happened or if anything did come of it, but I haven't been bothered since then. I'm a very kind person and people often take advantage of my openness. It really is a fatal flaw that I'm working really hard on. It's unfortunate that there are so many unhinged and lonely people but we really shouldn't make it our burden to help them. Sometimes being nice can actually cause a lot of mental strain. To Popcorn, let's not meet again. When I was younger it was just me, my mom, and my younger brother up until I was 14 years old. Every day except the weekends my mom would drive like 30 minutes away taking care of this family with four kids from 10 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon and then at 5 she would sometimes do a night shift at a diner a little further away from that. My brother and I were homeschooled and had tutors come in three days a week for four hours every time so we were mostly home alone unsupervised. Our closest neighbors were like half a mile away and no cars really ever passed us. The most I ever counted in a day was five. We lived in a really old shitty and small house and we had three dogs at this time, two German Shepherds and a Belgian Malinois, kind of the same thing as a German Shepherd, protective working dog, our neighbor gave us when his dog had puppies. 
Our yard was not gated and most days were spent outside on the porch with the fan on doing homework or reading while watching the dogs playing ball. After five every day we were under strict instructions from my mom to take the dogs in and shut the blinds and everything. But sometimes if I was bored or if the dogs were energetic I would let them out and play with them since our house was extremely small and these were some pretty huge dogs. One day I knew my mom was working the night shift. My brother and I decided to play with the dogs so he ran outside to grab the toys for the dogs. At night if we played it would be at the back of the house so my mom wouldn't know if she started to drive her car in. My brother was taking a super long time getting the toys and the dogs were inside with me going crazy barking so I stopped doing dishes and pulled down the blinds and looked outside and he's standing there talking to this man who seems urgently trying to rush him into his car. Right away I start screeching at the top of my lungs and run out of my house and the dogs run out also since I just want to get to my brother. Totoro, my smallest dog, 60 pounds if I remember correctly, jumped on him and he fell down and stayed on top of him barking. The two other dogs are barking like crazy too and I tell my brother to run back inside and I pull Totoro's tail and grab the scruff of his neck and I still remember his whimpers because it hurt when I did that and I made him go run back into the house with the other dogs. I pushed our dining table to barricade the door and spent the next 15 minutes really scared and holding a kitchen knife along with the dogs who were still barking like mad. I stayed on the couch peeking through the blinds and he looked super mad and just kept looking at our house and swearing. I was so scared he was going to come in and do something to us. He drove away pretty quickly and I think my mom got home about only about 30 minutes later but it felt so long. My brother and I told her what happened and he told her that he stopped and asked for directions and then started asking him if he was alone and if he wanted to go into his car and see his puppy. My brother told him he has three puppies and asked if he wanted to come in and see them and he started leading my brother away to his car. We drove to my neighbor's house and called the cops which drove in from the closest town out and they questioned us but I was 10 years old and if I remember correctly the only description I made was that the car was red and looked old and he was tall and white. I talked to my mom tonight and for the rest of the time we lived there we would see a police car drive down the street a few times a week and the officer that took my statement became very close with us. We had dinner together a lot and he would drive to our house and spend time with us if he was on patrol. We spent Christmas and Thanksgiving with his family until I moved to California a few years ago. He even took in Totoro and my old shepherd Ponyo because our apartment didn't let us have two big dogs. We are still very close and I see him as a dad even though we are five states apart. Unfortunately he is very sick from liver failure and my family is flying out to see him later this week for the last time which inspired me to tell this story. So the guy who tried to kidnap my brother, thanks for introducing me to the most loving and important person to me. I can't imagine the person I would be without him. I met my stalker when I was in middle school. My school consisted of 7th grade through 12th grade and had a normal program and an accelerated program, with the students in each program being pretty segregated. My friends and I belonged to the accelerated program, but there was one guy in the group from the normal program Carson. All in all we were typical teenagers with Carson being the group's prankster. We only could hang out at school, because we were all shipped in from various parts of the county for the accelerated program so after school we would all get on AOL to chat and play games. Online we had even more friends, as we'd invite our own local friends to also chat with us. One day, Carson invited his friend Steve to join the chat. He was nice and contributed a lot to our conversations. We learned Steve actually attended our school, but he was in the normal program and had a different lunch period than the rest of us, so we had almost no chance of crossing paths. We insisted on meeting him however and scheduled for Steve to come to my locker before first period. The next morning we waited and Steve never came. My friend and I did have a short exchange with another kid, Marco, which consisted of us telling him to go away. Marco had been Carson's satellite since the beginning of the year. Wherever Carson went, Marco would stand 10 to 15 feet away, just watching us. We had tried being friends with him, but he was simply too strange for us. He would touch your face unexpectedly or try and sneak up behind you to bite you, or tell you he wanted to see you inside out his list of strange behaviors was a mile long. A few days after Steve failed to come meet us, it came to light that Steve was really Marco and that the whole thing was one of Carson's pranks. Considering Marco had been a pleasant addition to the chat as Steve, 
we gave him another chance to join the real group. Besides Carson, I was the only person that really gave Marco a chance. He still did the weird things he had always been doing, but it was now apparent that it was all an act to get attention for being the weird guy. Marco was being abused at home by his mom's boyfriend. He rarely saw his mom, because she worked so much. Marco was the poster child for, bad attention is still attention. Still, my friends wanted him out of the group, and I repeatedly found myself arguing his case to let him stay. Once I caught an older student, a boy that lived on my street, beating Marco up. Being much larger than either of us, he was literally picking Marco up and slamming him into the lockers while he called him a freak. Knowing the bully and his mother, I did what was my signature move at the time and kicked him in the balls while threatening to tattle to his parents about how he was treating me and my friends. I believe this was the catalyst for years of torment, as Marco became MY Satellite after that day. At school Marco followed me any chance he got. At home, Marco messaged me non-stop, typically in private chat as my other friends wanted nothing to do with him. I felt bad, because he was a sweet kid besides his attention-seeking stunts, and no one should have to go through life with no friends. Eventually Marco asked me out, which I politely declined. He was my friend, but he was not the type of guy I would ever be interested in dating. He was persistent, begging me to give him a chance. Over and over again I would have to tell him no. One day his approach changed dash, you will go out with me or I'll show your mom all of our chat logs. There was nothing especially bad in the logs I wasn't drinking or doing drugs or really anything bad but I was pretty depressed at the times and sometimes talked about wanting to kill myself. If my parents saw that, I could effectively kiss my freedom and privacy goodbye. I bluffed him, telling him good luck with any attempts to convince my parents to believe him over me, which seemed to work. I wasn't very impressed with the stunt and stopped talking to him. A few weeks went by, and Marco came crawling back, begging for forgiveness. I eventually caved, allowing him back into the group. At first he was well behaved again, but slowly he started pestering me to be his girlfriend. Over the course of high school, he tried many different methods, begging, blackmailing, attacking my self-esteem, you're ugly, you're a slut, etc., catfishing, threatening any guys I dated threatening suicide, and more. I tried to be nice at first, but eventually had to get pretty mean in how I said no. His behavior would always reach a boiling point that forced me to cut him out of our friend group. It was nearly impossible to actually get rid of him, however. Online he would create dozens of new accounts to send messages from, overwhelming my attempts to block him. He would call my phone all night long and leave woeful messages about how lonely he was and how he would kill himself if I stopped being his friend. He would show up at my house and stand outside my bedroom window randomly. When my parents had parties, 4th of July, Thanksgiving, Halloween, etc., he always managed to find out and show up. Their parties were always pretty big with an open-door policy, so he'd slip in, typically in disguise. He'd then ultimately do something to get thrown out, like get belligerently drunk, or stuff his face with finger foods and then put them back on the serving platters. The first time I really felt that Marco might actually be a threat was at one of my parents' Halloween parties when we were 16. One of my dad's friends had a son our age, Tim, who was a bit of a jerk. He fancied himself pretty cool and thought it would be fun to pick a fight with the weird kid to make a display of his own superior strength. Marco accepted his challenge. We all knew he was about to get the crap beat out of him. Going out into the streets, Tim towered over Marco. That year Marco was dressed as Alex from A Clockwork Orange, his favorite book, with his costume including a cane. He swung the cane at Tim, hitting him in the head with it. Tim went down quickly, and Marco beat him until an adult intervened and sent him home. Marco's go-to threat whenever I had a boyfriend was, I'll beat him to death with a shovel and then use it to bury his body. Suddenly this threat seemed like something he'd be capable of. Our senior year of high school, Marco's dad died in prison. He learned the real reason his dad was in prison was for murdering someone he'd always thought his dad was in for drugs and Marco started to spiral out of control. He said his dad was a murderer, so he must also be doomed to be a murderer. He dropped out of school halfway through the year. My brother said after I'd left home for college, Marco came to the house looking for me a few times. Once he figured out I wasn't there, he'd just come and stand in the front yard aimlessly, playing with the BIC lighter until someone threatened to call the police. One of my biggest worries was that he'd try to set their house on fire in some weird way of trying to punish me. 
When I'd go home with my boyfriend, he'd always show up at my parents' house. At one point he tried to intimidate my boyfriend into breaking up with me by showing him he had a hunting knife. It was always a big ordeal getting him to leave. A lot of the issues have now eased up just due to the distance and time. I don't use much social media anymore and I'm able to semi-block people on my phone. It's a bit weird I can see when a blocked number tries to call me, but it doesn't ring, and I'm able to receive voicemails and text messages from blocked numbers, but not pictures. Initially he was calling and texting every day. Hundreds of messages. I tried asking him to stop, but this only encouraged him. My family no longer lives in that area, so I'm significantly less worried for their safety. I found the most successful way of dealing with Marco is simply ignoring him. Eventually his messages dwindled down to once a week, then once a month, now I maybe hear from him officially once a year. His message is typically something along the lines of, please, just be my friend. I won't try for anything more. I need you in my life. The last time I actually talked to him, which was about four to five years ago now, Marco tried to tell me I'd ruined his life. He said I had put some spell on him that he couldn't move forward with his life. He told me he would kill himself and it would be my fault. I finally had to tell him that I wouldn't care if he killed himself, in fact it would be a relief. His most recent MO is to call my work phone from a private number just to hear me answer the phone and then hang up. He also calls and texts my brother, our high school friends, my brother's best friend, my parents, my grandparents, my aunt, and my husband to beg them to ask me to call him. Marco messaged my husband, tell her she is my angel. The love of my life. I'm nothing without her. I worry he will snap someday and show up at my house or my job to kill me. I have security systems and other means of protection, but I still get paranoid about it. I've talked to the police about getting a restraining order, but they've told me there's no real grounds unless he starts showing up and threatening to kill me. So I guess we'll see what happens.